Hello. Hi, everyone. All right. Salut tout le monde, and hello, everyone, watching us live on Facebook. All right, yes. So uh, I definitely want to first off start off by welcoming everybody to our second UB Talk. It's a series of guest speakers, you know, who are innovative and inspiring uh, that we kind of organize here in Ubisoft uh, Quebec. So very cool. And today I'm very, uh, very feel very fortunate to be in front of all of you and introduce a very special guest. Uh, he is a creator of worlds. Uh, he's an astronaut. He's a co-founder and creative director at Portalarium, and his name is Richard Garriott. But before I pass over the microphone to him, I wanted to share with everybody here a little bit of a story of how Richard's work has kind of inspired me as a, as a game creator. So like so many others, I met Richard uh, through the world of Cesaria. It was back in 1986. I was eight years old. And I was lucky enough to have a friend who owned an Apple II and had a copy of Ultima I. Now fast forward 11 years, countless adventures in Ultima. Uh, I found myself one summer afternoon in 1997 rushing home to actually get my copy of Ultima Online, the beta CD, which I'm sure some of you here might remember that time. Uh, that was a moment for me uh, that I've actually never experienced before. Uh, to, to play Ultima Online, it was so open, so free. Uh, it, it basically gave me a new sensation I, I've never, I never experienced. And it was really, truly my kind of my first love affair with an MMORPG. Now, little did I know, a few, uh, not a few years later, but many, many years later, I would have the opportunity to carry the torch for Ultima Online as, as its producer, and in turn get to meet this inspiring creator. Ultima Online, as of this September, believe it or not, has been running for 20 years. It's two decades. This game has been growing and evolving over time, and quite honestly, due to Richard and the talent of him and his team, now, it's still today, still the longest running MMORPG to date. And Richard, as of now, is working with the Portalarium team back in Austin on creating a new open world RPG, a game called Shroud of the Avatar. It's a mix between offline and online play. And with that, I would encourage all of you to help me welcome Richard to the stage to give us a little bit of a speech about his journey. Thank you, Richard. Well, bonjour, and uh, thank you all so much for, for having me out. It's really a pleasure to be up here. Thank you, Jeff, for that also that great intro introduction and inviting me here in the first place. Uh, you know, coming up here to speak with all of you, uh, you know, it's not only a pleasure for me, but, you know, you know very well uh, the incredible leadership you now are providing in the industry today. So it's, uh, it's not only, I, I, I hope I get a chance to share some history and anecdotes and thoughts that, uh, that you might find inspiring in, in your work, but I can already tell you I've already been here for uh, not quite 24 hours now, and uh, I've already been very impressed with what you do here in this building, and I've obviously been impressed with your games uh, you know, for many years now, so it's, uh, uh, again, a pleasure to be with you. And uh, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about the career opportunity that I had, I am, I am just the right age to have gone into high school right as uh, personal computers were emerging uh, into existence. And so I am, you know, one of the, uh, had the opportunity to be one of the very first people to make video games, but that comes with an interesting side effect. You know, when I was 19 years old, I was one of the only people making video games. When I turned 20 years old, some new 19-year-olds got in. And so since the beginning, I've sort of been the oldest guy in the gaming industry. So, you know, you know as, I, as I look around the room, you know, I was, I was watching people come in, and I see one or two other people with gray hair, and that's about it, you know. So I'm, uh, I have been, since a child, you know, one of the, one of the oldest. And now, now that I'm 55, you know, old begins to mean something. But, uh, uh, but it's been an interesting journey, and I hope that uh, you'll, you'll find parts of this to be uh, useful for you. But I'm sort of, I'm going to cover a lot of topics today, and I'm going to hit some of them uh, going back and forth, so I apologize for uh, uh, the zigzag uh, presentation you'll get through this. But I'm going to talk really about three things. One is kind of these uh, the, the, the past, 
the relatively recent uh, and current present and, and a little bit on what I think is the future of role-playing games, uh, often illustrated, obviously, by some of my own work, since that's the, the work that I know best, but I'll, uh, I, I, hopefully you'll find some of this interesting. And uh, as Jeff mentioned, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, I, I brought copies of this book that I just uh, came out with, Explore and Create. I'm a big believer that uh, to do powerful original work, it's important not to just be inspired by your competitors within the industry itself, but really to pull inspiration from as far afield as possible. I think that if, you, if what you do is iterate on what other people are doing and just take one step beyond them, uh, you won't be nearly as successful in the long run as if you uh, uh, go much further afield. And so uh, that's at least my way to rationalize uh, my uh, strong belief in both exploring the reality in which we live uh, and, uh, and then using some of that inspiration to bring back to uh, the games that I've created. And, you know, uh, I put this slide up because th this is really when I started. I started, I'm, I'm sure many of you under remember what or have read about core memory, but I actually did my first work on computers with core memory. So this was, this was the memory inside of like a PDP-1 when I was first getting started. Each of those little donut-shaped disks is one bit. And so that is two bytes wide by 16 bytes tall. And if you remember, Ultima had these tile graphics I'll be showing you. That whole board would hold one tile in Ultima. And so, uh, and that used to be considered, you know, when I got started, that was considered a significant amount of memory. Uh, and it was obviously a very brute force uh, way of doing it. But the first games I wrote were also was on this machine. So in, in 1974, uh, I got a hold of a teletype. And uh, with this teletype, it began. I was also reading The Lord of the Rings, and I was playing uh, the game Dungeons and Dragons as it began uh, to uh, grow in popularity. And so I would create these uh, these video games where uh, you know the, the program was stored on these strips of paper tapes with uh, you know eight bits for a byte uh, punched in the tape. And when you would play the game, it would put asterisks for walls and spaces for corridors, dollar signs for treasure. A capital A might be a giant ant. And, uh, you know, and every time you'd make a move, you'd have to wait for this to print out. So it would take, you know, the frame rate was one frame every 30 seconds. You know, so uh, it was painful. But if you replace those ASCII characters with tile graphics, you can see that the, uh, a lot of the language that eventually would become uh, part of my later games was even started back here. And I'm going to be talking, uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to be talking, though, about uh, kind of these three eras. And for, I, I kind of think that with each era, uh, I've been involved with a new gaming company. I'm going to even talk about kind of what I, why I think new companies come into existence with each era. So, you know, in the solo player era, I founded a company called Origin, which eventually became part of uh, Electronic Arts. In the massively multiplayer era, I uh, split off from EA to start Destination Games, which became part of NCSoft. And now in this, this new era, uh, uh, that I'm still searching for a good term for, but my best of the moment is selectively multiplayer. Uh, you know, we have like, uh, my new company, Portalarium. But if you go back to that first era, it was dominated not only by solo player games, because there really was no internet back in these days, uh, but it was also a packaged goods at retail era. And so you had to go to a specialty, specialty store to buy a game. Uh, the games were pretty complex. The user interfaces in these early games were, frankly, terrible by today's standards. Uh, you know, to, to hook it up was required a significant amount of, of technical skill. And so the market was pretty much hardcore, geeky nerds uh, and no one else. So, uh, but maybe some of you uh, kind of uh, participated in, in, in uh, when you were eight years old or something here at this, at this stage. And, uh, and that's when I wrote this series of games, the, the, the solo player Ultima series was created during this 20 year span. And you can sort of see just by the screenshots from one to nine how you know, the, the visuals uh, you know, got better and better as the machine uh, speeds and capabilities got better and better. But I want to illustrate something though about some of these moments in time. And so this is one of the slides, I'm gonna come back to a similar slide every five years or so. Uh, and if you look back at the original Apple II, you know, it was a one megahertz machine it had up to 64K of RAM inside of it. 8K of that 64K, so about a tenth of the memory, was used up by, uh, by one image, the screen size. Uh, and you know, the floppy disk drives, uh, the five and a quarter inch floppy disks could hold 140K. And again, if you do that math, that's you know, 10 or 20 pictures would fit on a disk, and that's it, okay? And so just keep that in mind 
when you begin to see how machine speeds increase, notice the rate of increase of these other factors uh, as well at the same time, but we'll come back to that. But when I, uh, when I saw my first Apple II, which was a couple years after the teletype era, I immediately thought, I can now, here's a chance for me to get away from just these simple ASCII character graphics and I can do real 3D graphics. And my, my, uh, I didn't mention that my, my father is also an astronaut, my mother is an artist, uh, and so with a, you know, I, I think of computer games are the quintessential high-tech art, and so I had the perfect parents for, you know, uh, being one of the early movers in this uh, era. And, uh, and this is the actual piece of paper where I had my mom and my dad help me with this piece of paper to, my mom could draw the geometry for what perspective view would look like from an artist's perspective. And then my dad could sit there on the side and help me with the trigonometry uh, to kind of figure out how to, to draw in perspective. And that's what ultimately came up with the first, my first uh, commercial product, which was called a Calabeth, it's sort of Ultima Zero. Um, and that was, and in fact, a Calabeth was literally my last teletype game. I wrote 28 of them, D&D &D 1 through D&D &D 28 uh, on the teletype, and this first game was D&D &D 28B. I just ported it onto the Apple II, but I added these 3D, 3D graphics. And then to make monsters in the hallway, I would, you know, sit down and draw out on graph paper, you know, a, a simple line drawing version of what a monster might look like and kind of offsets for it, put it through those same simple equations, and there we have the Balrogs running down the corridors, super scary for, you know, 1980 version of graphics. Um, but that game, when I, I first started selling that game, uh, in fact, I was working at a, a, a Computerland store, one of the early computer stores. And back at this time, an Apple II computer cost about $3,000 to buy the machine. And the software that was for sale at these, at these stores was just a Ziploc bag with a disk hanging in it. And most software was like a, a checkbook balancing piece of software or a recipe card file and some really terrible word processors. And, uh, and people were paying, you know, three grand for a machine to do some pretty crummy tools. Uh, and it was the owner of the store that said, Richard, you know, your game is way more interesting than this other stuff we're selling on the wall. On the wall. You know, you should, you should publish that game. But there were, there, were, there were few, if any, publishers back then, so I produced it myself. So I, I manually copied discs and put them in a Ziploc bag, and I began to sell it. My, my mother drew the calligraphy of a Calabeth for me. Uh, and I started selling these for 20 bucks a piece on the store wall, uh, but I got a call from a, uh, the publisher of my mentor at the time, a guy we were just talking about, Bill Budge, uh, who, uh, Bill Budge's publisher, California Pacific, called me up and said, hey, we'd like to distribute your game nationally. They put it in a bigger Ziploc bag, put a color, a color sheet behind it, raised the price from $20 to $35, and, uh, and they sold 30,000 copies of that game, paid me $5 a piece, uh, if you do that math, that's $150,000 that I earned as a senior in high school uh, with about six weeks of my after school time. So that is still, not, that was about three times my dad's salary as an astronaut uh, and, and was to this day the best return on investment I've ever had in the computer game industry. It's been, it's been downhill ever since. But with that one behind me, I then set out to do, uh, uh, you know, I wanted to envision the world. I wanted to, you know, the, that 3D worked great for an underground corridor crawl, but wouldn't let me see the whole world that I wanted to explore. And so I started working on something called, that eventually became called Tile Graphics. But don't forget, this is back in the day, you know, you, you young kid whippersnappers have it so easy with your art tools. Let me, let me tell you how, how it was back in the, the, the days of, you know, the, of, uh, of, of, of hard to make computer games. You know, on the Apple II, you couldn't just put a white dot on the screen. Even pixels versus odd pixels showed up in different color palettes. And there was a, every eighth bit what didn't show on screen and instead was used as a color offset to the even and odd palette that might show up. And so to design, for example, what grass might look like, just a simple smattering of green dots was incredibly difficult. Uh, you'll actually see up in the upper left corner, that's actually I'm working on water. And so these are blue pixel columns. And I said, you know, I want to have little bumps in my waves. And I wanted to make sure that they would tile when you got to the edge of this one, it would tile to the next one, both horizontally and vertically. There's the green dots for grass. And so I'd first plan it out on graph paper. Then I'd convert that to binary. Then I'd convert that to hexadecimal. Then I would have to 
manually poke that hexadecimal into memory. Then I had to write a piece of code to copy those 32 bytes into the area that 8K of memory, which was not linearly laid out. It was a very complex layout. So I had to do a, you know, incredibly difficult math uh, for a kid. And, uh, uh, and then when you'd run it on screen, you know, if it, if it didn't look like grass, like you didn't, want, you didn't want to see stripes or bars or things in it, so, and you wanted your trees to kind of not show that it was square tiles, but rather kind of make you know, some other kind of shape to make an illusion or, or at least uh, to uh, uh, not make obvious the tiling. And so if it didn't show up right, if it was the wrong color or you saw some striping or whatever it might be, you didn't have to sit down and go like, well, where did I screw up? You know, did I, did I screw up in the binary? Did I screw up in the hexadecimal? Did I screw up in the code? And so even just debugging an individual piece of art was incredibly difficult. Uh, but it worked. And, uh, uh, and that's what brought up, brought up the first uh, Ultima. And then you can see that you know, with each Ultima, even though these first ones were on this, that same machine, the Apple II, uh, I became more and more clever about how I could uh, overlay memory being brought in off disks and things to give me more room for graphics. So I went from 32 tiles to 64 tiles. Uh, when we got up to Ultima 2, you know, most of my competitors back in these days were coin-op knockoffs. So instead of playing asteroids on a 25-cent machine at the video game hall, you could play Apple-oids on your Apple 2. Uh, and centipede versus millipede, or whatever it might be. You know, there were basically most games were still pretty short-term development rapid iteration products. And my games were very rapidly became big. And so I was much more interested in making sure that the way my games were presented to the public was what I felt was appropriate for the virtual worlds that I was beginning to imagine I was creating. And so Ultima 2, uh, I had a very different plan for. I didn't want my games in a Ziploc bag. I wanted my game in a box. And I didn't want there to just be uh, some instruction manuals that talked about the fact that you were playing on a computer. I wanted to to make you believe that when you opened that box, you were being transported to a new world. And so Ultima 2 became not only the first game in the industry in a box, but also the first to start beginning to include swag, like cloth maps and trinkets and that sort of thing. Then, uh, uh, and of course, the graphics you know, become um, uh, more detailed. So we move up to Ultima 3, and we're up to 128 tiles. And you can see the detail and the animation is getting better. And I'm beginning also to you know, because I'm, even from the beginning, I'm sort of simulating or emulating Dungeons and Dragons, right? So this is a, even though these are, it's a solo player era, but because what I'm doing outside of writing the games is a social experience, I'm compelled to start putting a party of players in with you. So that the, uh, for those of you who, who have played in the Ultimas, you'll know like Yolo and Shamino and Dupre and all these early characters that were actually my friends in, in college uh, that I just began to, you know, emulate uh, you know, in the game as, as party members. Uh, <clears throat> then Ultima 3 was actually, when I split off on my own, I started my first company. So Origin, my first company, was started with Ultima 3. And what was interesting about publishing my own games is it was suddenly also the first time I began to get what you might call fan mail. And, you know, I'm sure you all get fan mail also. Uh, and so I expect you are familiar with what fan mail looks like which is usually one paragraph of, hey, I love your games, and then pages of, let me tell you what you did wrong and how you could make your game better. Uh, and one of the things I noticed was that people weren't playing very heroically. When people would play, they would often write in saying, you know, I love the game, and what I like doing most is killing every villager in the town, stealing everything from every shop and house, uh, and of course, killing you, Lord British. That's my favorite. And, uh, and so I said, wait a minute, that's no, that's no good. I mean, I, I was writing these games thinking you were going to be this great hero, and in fact, you're being a pretty dastardly, terrible person. Maybe I need to change the way I'm doing games. And so I decided to create a game, uh, Ultima 4, uh, where you were going to be forced to, to behave heroically. And, uh, and I knew that I couldn't just tell you that up front. I had to show you, or I wanted to show you why that was important. So I... I let you lie and cheat and steal, and pretty much everybody did lie and cheat and steal. But later you would need to come back to the person you were cheating and ask for help, and if you were lying and cheating and stealing, which you probably were, they, that character would go, I'd love to help the hero, but you're the most dis dishonest, thieving scumbag I've ever met, so no way I'm helping you. And, uh, and I wanted you to take responsibility. I wanted to make sure you weren't, you as the player, 
didn't feel like this character you were playing was some alter ego. You weren't playing Conan the Barbarian. It was you inside that character. And that's when I borrowed the Sanskrit word avatar, which historically has meant the, it was the term used for a deity on earth in human form. And I said, that's sort of what it is like you as a player. If I'm transporting you into my virtual world, that is your avatar in this virtual world. And so Ultima IV Quest of the Avatar is also the, the, uh, the time uh, where uh, the word avatar became uh, popular in the gaming genre. But now let's go up, now we're up into the early 80s, as the IBM PC began to take over. Now, it's an interesting case study here is to look at these metrics about speed. So, you know, the early 8086s ran about 10 megahertz, so that's 10 times faster. However, you only have about uh, one picture, instead of taking 8K, now it takes 64K, so it's eight times bigger, almost 10 times bigger. And the RAM is 640K instead of 64K, that's 10 times more RAM. And the floppy disk can hold 1.4 megabytes now, which is about 10 times bigger. And so everything has gotten better, so to speak, by a factor of 10, until you think about the fact that if you, if you have a picture that's 10 times as big and you have to move it, well, it takes 10 times the processing speed to move it. And if you have to store images on disk, and the, but the picture is 10 times as, de as dense, you're not really storing any more pictures on disk. And so it's, it, while, while the visual quality is getting much better, the actual challenge of creating a game has not gotten much better. In other words, in, in many ways, you're treading water uh, at, a, at a fundamental animation rate uh, standpoint. And, uh, uh, and so it just sort of illustrates, in my mind, sort of the, the, the wall we've been up against uh, for at least the first 20, 30 years of the, of the industry. And then... Uh, for the next games, I, I began to really focus on story craft. And so, you know, if you look at Ultimas 1, 2, and 3, they are either in Cesaria, my old D&D world, or Ultima 2 was on Earth, because they needed time travel and Earth seemed to make it relevant. Ultima 3 went back to Cesaria. Ultima 4 was when I finally said, okay, I'm gonna quit plagiarizing from everybody else, and I'm gonna actually make my own world from scratch. And so Ultima 4 is really where Britannia began, the word Avatar began, and I began to really dig into game design, I think, in a much uh, deeper, more relevant way. And I'll take you through some of the visual changes. That was for Ultima 5. You know, by the time we get up to Ultima 6, we're up to uh, a thousand tiles now to make the world, and they're beginning to take on perspective, and we're beginning to think about user interface now instead, because, you know, prior to this, every letter of the keyboard in those early Ultimas meant a command. A meant attack, B meant board a vessel, C meant cast a spell, D meant drop an item, E meant enter something, F meant fire ship weapons. It was nightmarish. Uh, you not only had to memorize 26 or worse commands, uh, but they, of course you had to also learn them in English, and uh, this is also as the world is becoming a marketplace, and so it was, uh, uh, it, 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 while the games were becoming more sophisticated, frankly they were becoming harder and harder, and here's where we began to really revise user interface to a kind of verb-noun indication uh, that was uh, much more successful. Um, then uh, as we get over to Ultima 7, you know, I, at Ultima 7, Ultima 4 and Ultima 7 are two of my favorite Ultimas. Uh, Ultima 7 from an, a full reality simulator. You know, uh, one of the hallmarks I still keep in my games to this day is don't lie to players. Don't mislead players. If you put something in the world that looks like it should interact, right, in the real world, I have an assumption as to how that will work. I mean, if I put that door into the game, I should expect to be able to turn that handle and open it. And, and if you don't fulfill that, if you can't fulfill that, then don't give me the door. Don't make a door look like it should be operational if it's not going to be operational. And so uh, Ultima 7 was kind of the first time I really devoted to that level of detail in the uh, open world reality craft. Um, then, uh, you know, Ultima 8, we're, we're no longer really in tiles anymore. Now we're actually just in sprites that are uh, set in XYZ uh, position. And, um, uh, uh, and this game, I'll, I'll describe a little later why this game had a, some trouble. This is one of the first games I did that I, I'm not satisfied with the way that it launched. Uh, but had we done it correctly, or had we launched it in a more successfully, uh, finished it properly, shall we say, uh, I think that would have been uh, one of my favorites. Um, and again, you're going up now, we're in the middle of the 90s, and now we're 20, a full 20 years later, and you can see those same metrics. I won't dwell on it, but you get the idea. They're now up to 100 times faster than the Apple II. But again, pick images are about 100 times bigger, the disk space is about 100 times bigger, et cetera. We're still treading water 
from an animation frame rate standpoint for how much has to be moved in order to make these prettier and prettier pictures. And, but this is also when, the, when it really began to change. So the late 90s is when 3D render pipelines began to offload that work from the GPU, uh, from the CPU into a GPU, uh, and that actually has fundamentally been a game changer. So this is when that argument sort of ends. But for, for 20 years, we were treading water in a uh, uh, difficult way uh, that finally began to, to break clear. And, uh, and so this is sort of the, the case of what I was just saying, is the, this kind of uh, uh, tenfold increase time after time. Um, but the GPU, the, 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 the coming of age of the GPU really freed us up to begin to visualize uh, and envision much broader, much deeper, much more detailed uh, worlds than we ever had before. Um, and, in, and of course, I embraced it, uh, as, did, as did everybody. Um, and so now I want to I talk about, kind of a, a, for me, a lesson. So I'm at the, kind of the end of the solo player era, at least for me, and uh, talk about some of the, at least for me, those lessons. And, you know, it's interesting. We had this hallmark at Origin where we said, uh, you know, people would often ask us, you know, Origin was uh, uh, very good or bad, I'm not sure even how you describe it, about uh, we pushed the hardware hard. We, you know, if you, were, if you bought an Origin game, you pretty much also had to go buy new hardware almost every new game we released. And, and we often would second guess that ourselves and would often be asked that by other people. But our conclusion was that, you know, people never would write about it. A reviewer or a player will never say, that's the very best game that I've ever seen that still plays on an 8086. They either write, that's the very best game I've ever seen, or they write nothing at all. And we also concluded that you know, active software players, people who are paying 50 bucks a pop for a game multiple times per quarter, are also people who are willing to pay a similar amount of money for their hardware on an ongoing basis. They're willing to, get, they're willing to upgrade their hardware or, or buy more peripherals or whatever it might be. And so n knowing that we were kind of dealing with that concurrently was uh, important. Um, another thing that, that I, though I learned during this period is as I began to focus more on gameplay depth, it was interesting to see how a lot of other people were developing really for the bells and whistles of presentation. And if you look at who was winning on any particular year to do the very best bells and whistles in a game, it was rarely that same team that was winning the bells and whistles race the next cycle. And so if you're going to compete on writing the best uh, you know, uh, graphics engines, more power to you except to realize that you're going to be in that race for the rest of your life. And whenever there's a younger, faster, slicker person in on that race, there's reasonable odds you will no longer be in a leading position. And what I'd sort of stumbled into is by developing intellectual property that had more depth to it, I could survive better some of the other highs and lows are getting beat on the bells and whistles. That the bells, you know, the, the, the visual eye candy, audiovisual eye candy, which is essential, and is a great sales tool, uh, uh, I, I feel is a, uh, more, a more difficult path uh, than, uh, uh, than developing intellectual property that lasts. And to me, what I sort of began to learn about that, starting again with Ultima 4, was you know, creating you know, uh, storylines that have social relevance, things that talk about the human condition right now, things that you know, don't just write a story, write a story that reflects the, the social issues that we are all struggling with in reality now, but recast into the scene of the story. Uh, I began to learn things about uh, uh, iconic imagery, and, and uh, uh, as I began to see competitors fall off, and I would kind of think about why they fell off, and realize that a lot of their image, their, their visual iconography, which I'll talk about in a little a minute here, uh, I, I feel was uh, weak. Or, uh, you know, as I became uh, what I consider myself a Tolkien-style developer, where you, you know, we the developers need to know a lot more about the reality of the world we're, we're living in than, um, uh, uh, than the player would. Uh, and this kind of truthiness, the simplified truths of the, of the, of the fantasy, the rules of the fantasy architecture uh, become uh, uh, important. And so, if you look at Ultimas 4 through 7, for example, I won't go into them here for time, but each one of those was talking about what I really felt was happening around me, the, the social problems that, that I saw around. I began to notice things like uh, 
uh, another one of the popular games we had at Origin was called Wing Commander. And what was interesting about Wing Commander is that, you know, if you, if you look at my wonderful drawings that I did with the, you know, the PC art tool, uh, up at the top, you know, everybody recognizes the, you know, classic rocket, the classic, uh, you know, UFO, and then, you know, things from Star Wars. But all of us can draw those with very few elemental primitives. And, uh, but if you look down there at the, at the bottom right, that is, in Wing Commander, that was a ship called the Drolfi. And that's the one I remember because it's easy to draw. I can, I can see it in my mind. I can, uh, I can see the silhouette in my mind. And with simple graphics primitives, I can draw the same thing myself. And, and so Wing Commander 1, I actually thought had really successful visual iconography because it could stay in my brain. But once in later games, you know, Wing Commander started doing you know, much more you know, globular ships with engines and gun mounts and turrets and things all over it. And I felt after a while, they might look big and they might look mean and, and scary at the time I was looking at them. But I, to this day, couldn't tell you what they look like. I mean, I couldn't, I don't even remember what, the, what even the silhouette was, much less the detail. And, uh, and these were some of the, the things I was beginning to pick up from, uh, from this point in time in the gaming industry, or the games we were ma making. And, you know, when I was starting to talk about virtues and these things, you know, try to put, uh, you know, when I decided I wanted to talk about, you know, being good, and I'm going, look, well, you know, what does that mean in modern times? You know, you could... Do I want to do a game that talks about the Ten Commandments? I'm going, nah, that, that wouldn't really be me. Uh, do I want to talk about, you know, Buddhist ideals? You know, maybe not. Do I want to talk about Greek mythological ideals? And I'm going, no, I really need something modern. And there really wasn't a good modern source for virtues. So I'm going to have to make up my own from scratch. And I'm going, like, that's going to, you know, I'm not a philosopher. And, uh, but I started doing a whole bunch of research. And, uh, and as I've done, like, this is another thing I keep coming back to when I talk to my own team about game design is the, 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 the foundational need for doing research. If you're going to design a world from scratch, you need to research what it is you're trying to say uh, uh, to find the right inspirations and find the right way to respin that. And, uh, uh, and so I began to talk about things like truth and love and courage, sort of these foundational pieces that I kind of pulled out uh, from doing a, a bunch of research, uh, and found ways to articulate it that began to have a, uh, if you're familiar with the comedy news guy Stephen Colbert, uh, the term truthiness, things that sound true, uh, even if they're made for a game and they're fictional, I began to realize if you build things with certain patterns, like these truth and love and courage can be combined in eight ways for the eight virtues, and there were eight good towns and eight bad dungeons, and uh, the, there, were, there were these three, uh, you know, uh, omens in the sky, uh, 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 comets that would foretell the movements of the bad guys, and so there was sort of this numerology that began to resonate with both the fiction that I was trying to express, as well as the physical construction of the game itself, and that made it have truthiness, and it began to be, you could, you could then predict, you could begin as a player, you go, oh, I get it, you know, there's, I have to, if I'm going to solve these three things, I know there's going to be a pattern to it that I can then begin to work out things you haven't even told me about that might be coming up in the future. And uh, uh, another, another lesson of this period was uh, uh, making sure that the, the bad guys are reactive. I mean, it, one of the things that uh, uh, I realized pretty early on was uh, that, you know, most games, the bad guys wait for you to become powerful enough to come kill them. The bad guys aren't actually doing anything bad. I mean, they're, they, they, the, all, the, all the villagers talk about how evil and horrible that person is, but all they're doing is sitting there. And often, when the players are min-maxing their way to the top, they're in fact being, as I would mentioned before, more evil than the bad guy. And so I think that's backwards. And so I try to make sure that as you go through the game, anybody that helps you, any villager you talk to that gives you the piece of information you need, the bad guy's gonna go kill him. And that way, you actually kind of feel guilty about the fact that you've been leaning on other people for help. And it makes you much, it makes the bad guys much more sinister, and it also makes you more careful in the way you tromp through the world. Um, you know, uh, something Jeff and I were talking about the other day is how much I'm into languages uh, and, as part of this history. You know, and, 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 it, and the first case, uh, you know, uh, in early Ultima, I, I used this runic language, which is really the same as Tolkien used, which is based on the Druidic ruins that you can look up in almost any dictionary or at the time uh, uh, in uh, 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 
some other kinds of uh, physical materials. Now you can do it on the internet, of course. Um, but keeping that truthiness going, I did things like, uh, I'm a big believer that one of the things that separates a science fiction from a fantasy is in science fiction, they usually stick with the rules of reality plus a cheat, like faster than light travel that might be their cheat, but otherwise everything lives within the laws of physics. And my problem with most fantasies is they just cheat arbitrarily. Like, oh, I'm almost finished, but I can't get past the final door. But look, there's a magic item that just fixed it. And magic is the trivialized way that all problems are solved. And in that sense, I prefer science fiction. And so what I try to do with my fantasy is develop it like a science fiction. I say that, you know, if you're going to have magic, uh, you know, the, the spells and potions have a logic to why they're built up. And so you use the reagents the, the, the reagents of my ingredients are used uh, logically. The words you speak to invoke the magic are chosen logically. So uh, anyway, those are, there's a couple of the lessons out of the solo player area. So now we move up to uh, uh, the online games, the MMO space. And, you know, the, and with online games, of course, by being on the internet, it means we at least have the option to do digital downloading. So, but there was still a this is still a time where retailers were, retailers were still big, at least in the early part of this. But a lot of the revenues begin to come directly online through subscriptions, in the case of Ultima Online. Um, and, uh, and we're beginning to see digital downloading or digital patching and updating to be kind of a standard. But the games, if anything, at least for, you know, for Ultima Online through World of Warcraft, I would argue they actually got more complex. We didn't make games you know, they, they became big sellers despite the fact that they're actually more complex and harder and more expensive to operate. Uh, but, uh, but that's, and I think the reason why it grew despite that complexity was because of how powerful it is to not just play alone, but to play with your friends and deepen your relationship with your friends. And so uh, online games, uh, uh, you know, started to fulfill a very important gap. And, uh, uh, and you know, we, when we had been pitching this game that we used to call Multima, multiplayer Ultima, for uh, you know five or ten years, uh, you know, prior to eventually getting it off the ground as Ultima Online. And uh, Star Long, who is my still my production partner to this day, uh, you know, uh, deserves the credit for you know uh, uh, really assembling and driving, assembling the team and driving this product to what it became. And obviously, Jeff had some history with this game too. Um, but uh, but what's also interesting about this is that. Every time there's a new revolution, this is also when big publishers often don't get it. And so, you know, I would even offer for you guys or EA or anybody that once, once, you have a, once you are a company that has your own product line that you are now shepherding and having to work really hard just to not blow the sequel and you're spending tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars and years in development, you by necessity become somewhat risk averse. And that is, I think, the nature of the beast. But what it also means is every time there's one of these upheavals of a new kind of business model, a new kind of game, it's commonly not the big companies that either do it first or manage to master it and become dominant in that next era. And I would say that companies like Blizzard or uh, Zynga and you know, numerous others have come into existence because of the lack of ability to move and dominate those spaces quickly uh, by the bigger companies that also were around at the time. So even though we gave, you know, we gave, you know, we, we fought tooth and nail to get Ultima Online greenlit at EA. It was very hard. Uh, we were really considered the bastard stepchild project through most of its development until the actual sales proved that we were right. Until the actual sales were 10 times, more than 10 times, 100 times more than EA's sales projections. Uh, but even after that, they still felt that that was a flash in the pan. They didn't believe that the MMO model was the way of the future, and that's really what uh, opened the door uh, for, uh, for Blizzard uh, and other uh, companies to really kind of rise to dominance. And one of the things that was really special about UO and the type of MMO that at least I'm a fan of is that uh, the, uh, it allowed people to play not only with each other networked across the globe, but play in a wide variety of roles that were deeply interconnected, that were unrelated to combat. So there are people who live their whole lives as farmers or explorers or building cities and role-playing cafes or being a fisherman or, you know, uh, being a pet tamer. Whatever your livelihood and lifestyle was like, uh, we tried to support these deep, diverse roles that were also inter-reliant uh, upon each other. Um, 
since uh, EA didn't want us to go off and do it really any other MMOs, we split off. I, I did a game called Tabula Rasa. Uh, and uh, I've got one, one other one of these uh, language issues I want to showcase with this game, uh, which is I, uh, the game is about uh, uh, an alien race that has visited the Earth and left messages behind for us uh, to help us survive the future uh, onslaught of, uh, of this warlike alien that you know, takes, is taking over the universe. And I said, okay, well, if I'm going to leave symbols behind in a language, you know, and having grown up in the space program where you might remember we sent this uh, vehicle called Voyager out into space uh, with a record on it that includes the word hello in all the languages of Earth, which I think is a waste of time because there's no information in it. It's just, it's just the word hello in a, a, a vast number of, uh, you know, different dialects. And I'm going, and if I was an alien, you know, what the heck would you do with that? You know, it's, it's not telling me anything. And so I said, okay, I want to develop an actual language that is easy to read for aliens throughout the universe or all humans on Earth without regard to their cultural background. How can I do that? And I did research again on all these different uh, solutions and wasn't particularly happy with them, except this one here called Bliss Symbolics. It was a language that was created to communicate with the mentally handicapped. And it actually had the best, it was the best pictographic attempts at communication. And using that as a basis, but then going off and building my own, I, I came up with a basis of kind of little symbols that, that would, uh, we, it would be reasonably self-evident what I was trying to communicate if you saw those symbols. And then variations on those symbols, uh, and I still have it, you know, on my desk in, in Austin, Texas, I still have all these little strips of paper that I made for figuring out the... Uh, which base symbols and which modifiers would work more universally until eventually I came out with this language that uh, 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 that really almost any player who put their mind to it, I mean, you, you don't need to read it, but if you do, if you bother, you'll learn that it in fact is real. So it gives back to this truthiness again of making the world feel real. And then I could not only bury that language in all the art and artifacts, but it would show up in the logos sort of magic method you could do. I even took it with me to space. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, again, one of these kind of foundational uh, bits. And <clears throat> one of my lessons here for the MMO area, or some of the lessons, are, you know, one is that, you know, unlike in the, in the solo player gaming era, you know, you, 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 you ship a game to the public and, and the, you don't usually, you hopefully don't patch it. You know, it's done. The, con the totality of, of what you are creating is finished at the moment you launch it. Well, in a massively multiplayer game, in an online persistent game, of course that's not true. But we, frankly, radically underestimated that issue when we did Ultima Online. That's only the beginning. In fact, when you, it's, it's sort of like, imagine we went and built the city. Let's suppose the people in this room, we came here to what would eventually be Quebec City, and only we went from dirt to building every building, every road, we put every computer on every surface. We put every item for sale in every shop. We set the prices. We ran every electrical line. We ran every plumbing line. And only after we few finished the entire city of Quebec City did we say, hey, everybody, come on, move in. And let's say a million people moved in. What are the odds that it works? Zero. <clears throat> You know, what are the odds that people are happy with it? They're, they're happy with the taxation rates or the prices? Zero. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and, so, and so since things will, things, things will break, and or even if they're functioning, people will have an opinion about what should be higher, what should be lower, what should be changed. And so now you're going to have a million people all trying to talk to us. And so I don't care how many of us are on email trying to answer questions, they're not going to believe we're listening. They're going to assume that their email went to you know, some dead mailbox somewhere and that we are clearly ignorant of their strife in life. Uh, and they're going to be angry with us for, in their minds, good reasons. And, and that, that is a real lesson to the hierarchy of government. You know, if you think about Quebec City, you know, there are school boards, there's neighborhood associations, there's all the, all the people of the community exist in, in structures and whether that's to pick up the trash or keep the lights on, there are people providing, there's a large number of people maintaining and updating all those services. And so Ultima Online shipped without that, and we quickly learned how to build the, this hierarchy within the community to provide the same kind of functions that exist here in the real world uh, that uh, are essential. 
Um, I'm going to skip over a couple here and, and uh, uh, also, uh, you know, just note the fact about the fact about how, how fast these machines are getting. You know, in fact, uh, <coughs> you know, it, it's interesting if you think about floating point operations, um, you know, it's just, it's stunning how far we've come just in my lifetime. And not only how much faster they are, but how much cheaper it is per computational cycle. You know, uh, back when I was born, I think that's eight trillion, maybe it's higher than that, whatever's above a trillion. Eight something, eight, eight, eight thousand three hundred trillion, uh, you know, uh, dollars per flop, uh, uh, per gigaflop, you know, down to where now it's, you know, eight cents. And, uh, or less, because that's a couple years old now, this slide. And, uh, and so the computational ability we have is just stunning. But what I find interesting and how this, how this relates to what you and I do as game developers is here's the pickle that I see that we're in. You already heard me talk about uh, the race for the bells and whistles of audiovisual presentation versus the depth of your intellectual property. But here's what I've seen after 42 years of developing computer games. There is this cycle to where every time some great new innovation comes out, 3D hardware, a hard drive, the internet, um, uh, I'll probably think of a few others. Uh, the best-selling game right after one of those major upheavals is a simple first-person shooter. You know, I use my friend John Carmack's, uh, John Carmack's uh, games for this. You, know, you look at Castle Wolfenstein or Doom or Quake. These are perfect examples of whenever there's a radical new way to make the audiovisuals better, all people need and want is a first-person shooter just to show it off. But when there's stability in the platform, if you're going to compete with that first-person shooter, you've got to do something with a little more depth. There's got to be some healing packs, or maybe there's got to be some character attributes, or some other gear I can carry, or a little bit of a story, or a little bit of role-playing in some sense. But then as soon as there's a radical improvement again, everybody goes back to the first-person shooter. And to me, that is an interesting reality that we live in, is this, this constant uh, needle that swings back and forth between first-person shooters all people need, through, hey, we really need some intellectual property depth to make it worth my time to be there. And I've at least decided for me, I'm, I now compete on the intellectual property side because I'm not willing to, I'm, I'm too old to keep up with the race of only audiovisual bells and whistles. Um, but uh, now I want to talk about, I'm going to wrap up here uh, with talking about uh, kind of where we are, I think, now. So this is the game I'm working on now at Shroud of the Avatar. Uh, we're in this era where I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to, at least in my case, bring back some of the best thinking of solo player era storytelling and social relevance. I'm trying to also be respectful of the, uh, uh, of the power of community. Uh, but we're making some pretty radical changes. Uh, for example, if you think about most MMOs, they're broken up into things called, uh, that are called shards, you know, where we have server sets, that where you know, the world can't actually handle as many people as there are on Earth. And so you break it up into individual uh, uh, shards which is a term stolen again from Ultima Fiction, but is now pretty common in uh, online gaming. Uh, but when you break the world into shards, it means you're separating people who actually probably have some relationship in the real world. So you, uh, in fact, if you look at UO, it still has the shards that it started with. We've never managed to collapse, or they never managed to collapse those shards back together, even though there's far fewer people playing today, but they're now even further separated because of the shards. So we wanted to change radically the, the, the the technical aspects of the experience to make sure people can play together. Um, the, uh, oh, pardon, I, I, I do want to mention one thing here too before I get back into Shroud of the Avatar. I apologize, this slide's a little out of order. You know, if I think about the, my favorites and non-favorites in, uh, in, in, my, in my time together, it's interesting that, you know, my favorites are probably Ultima 4, Ultima 7, and Ultima Online. It is at least interesting to note that those three games were games that my publisher, which was often my brother, <laughs> you know, and my family and my teammates did not believe in. But I had a very clear vision that I stood by from beginning to end and shipped it the way I really believed in my heart of hearts it should be. And they were not only my personal favorites, they were also the most economically successful. And it's interesting that the two kind of bobble, bobbles that I've had, the less successful ones, even though I'm, there's aspects of these other two that I'm still extremely proud of, but they were both times where I had, it was the first product I did after becoming part of a big company. You know, Ultima 7, we, we, EA acquired Origin during Ultima 7, but Ultima 7 stayed with its original vision. Ultima 8, 
we try to act more like EA and ship things on an EA schedule and staff like EA staffs and listen to their feedback and, it, and we ship that game unfinished and unbalanced. Uh, and similar with Tabula Rasa, we were working with the Korean company NCSoft and we spent two years wasting time up front trying to figure out how to create art that would be both appreciated by the Korean player and by a United States player and eventually gave up and just said, you know, let's just make one we, can, we like ourselves here in the United States and you know, we'll, we'll figure out Korea later. But that wasting of two years up front put us way behind schedule and way over budget that we really never recovered from. And, uh, and so it's just interesting to note how important it is to get a clean start and to stand by your vision for a game versus you know, take too much feedback from uh, 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 you know, your bosses. <coughs> Sorry, bosses. Um, so now I'm going to go into Shroud of the Avatar. So uh, I was talking a little bit about this, uh, uh, you know, how we're really trying to bring everyone together into a single metaverse. Uh, the, uh, you know, we're, 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 we've also learned things like, um, you know, if you contrast what we're doing to, say, World of Warcraft. In World of Warcraft, everyone is a combatant, and the best gear in the game is things you find on a, a raid against a tough monster. And we actually think that means that the crafters in the game will never be the most successful thing to be because the game, the developers of the game are always making stuff that's better than the players can make. And so we're actually flipping that on its head. We actually, in Shroud of the Avatar, we, the company, make none of the gear. Uh, we just make parts and pieces and resources. And it's all only players that make the gear in the game. And we think that will be much more successful. You know, we're... we're we think that a lot of modern RPGs become too brain dead, where you get a quest, you, know, you talk to somebody, get a quest, you see an arrow on the map, and you follow it brainlessly until you get to the place to go fight the level one monsters and level grind up. And um, we're going back to more text parsing and needing to remember and think about what you want to do uh, in the game. And we're uh, creating a deep virtue story as, as, uh, uh, as common. And in my case, since I've started without a big publisher's pocketbook, we're, you know, by necessity started in another way. We're doing crowdfunding. But in addition to crowdfunding, we're doing crowdsourcing. The community's involved in the creation of art and music and code. We're developing completely in the open. You know, unlike, you know, I had to sign an NDA to walk in the door yesterday. And uh, I gotta tell you, not only do we not have NDAs, every day we publish literally what every person on every, every member of every team is working on to the general public is published within minutes of our scrum kind of meeting in the morning. And so we do everything completely in the open. Uh, and so uh, if you come to Portalarium, you won't need to sign an NDA. Uh, you know, and, uh, but, and, and but by doing this so much in the open, it's also interesting, and again, kudos to Star Long for doing this. We are now up to, we're working on release 42, and for 41 months so far, we have released a new version of this game to within two minutes of on time on the third Thursday of the month every month for 41 months. And our servers have been online and available and functional 100, with 100% uptime for 41 months. And, and it's part of this discipline that we've gotten ourselves into with uh, our development process that I think is, uh, uh, has, has created that opportunity. And, and of course, we're also now looking, we're exploring new business models that are not exactly subscription, not exactly free to play, some uh, kind of a, a blend that I could get into if people have some questions about it. But my last couple slides here are just some images of, you know, the, the world of New Britannia that I'm making, uh, you know, the interdependent skill sets that we believe are essential for community growth, uh, the, uh, the virtues, stand by the virtues, Lord Bruce says, you know, the, the fact that you can look up into the night sky and see the planets moving and the positions of the planets and the moons tell you exactly how the bad guys, it really is the omens of the sky are exactly what is really happening inside, so just to work out this math was nightmarish. Uh, it's probably well beyond what most players, most players will frankly care about, but it is in the game, and you can buy little oraries to put in your house, and if you look at your orrery, you can predict where the bad guys are gonna be next. And so for those that choose to get into it, you know, they can do that uh, uh, in detail. Uh, so we already have, I think, a, a quite a strong community around it. And, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, we've also come full circle in a very meta way uh, there's a teletype in Shroud of the Avatar that actually runs that very first game that I showed you the paper tape spool of. Uh, and so now we've come full circle to uh, emulate a game that hasn't been played in, you know, 42 years uh, that now you can play again in Shroud of the Avatar. And uh, this is the place we're just now releasing. This is something we only released to the audience, our, our, our players, uh, a few days ago. 
Uh, but if I'm a, I'm a, one of my big inspirations in life was a movie called Metropolis. And uh, uh, the robot in Metropolis, the actual name of that robot is the Ultima Futura Automaton. And so uh, I've, I've, I've borrowed that uh, variation of that robot to bring back as our oracle in Shroud of the Avatar. So anyway, that's uh, where we are. So thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for those people watching on Facebook Live. <laughs> And, uh, and for all of you here in the building, uh, I think we've, I, I know I've kind of burned the vast majority of our official hour, uh, but if, uh, if you all are interested, I'm very happy to take some questions uh, here. There's a microphone up front if you'd like to come up to ask some questions here on uh, anything about games or space if you so are interested. Happy to talk about that as well, but please come, come to the microphone if you have any questions. Howdy. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I didn't get into this set of slides is, uh, and something Jeff and I talked about briefly, is, is uh, things like virtual reality. And, you know, what I, what I find interesting uh, about that subject as one of the many that comes up is, you know, I've been quintessentially a VR fan as well as a VR skeptic. Uh, my whole life, and and frankly, I'm still on the skeptic side. And uh, you know, if you look at the forecasts for the uh, sales of VR games here in the next couple of years, I mean, they're they're expecting billions of dollars in or they're forecasting billions of dollars in retail sales of the software. And I just don't see it happening. I you know I don't uh, you know I, there's only like three games that have earned more than a million dollars, and there's only I think 30 games that have earned more than 250 thousand dollars, and that's even including the money coming from the hardware makers. So the investment in VR is enormous, and so if you are a VR developer being funded by Oculus, you might be able to make some money if if you charge for your development. But to me, that is not uh, a, a business. You know, you uh, to be a successful business, you really have to have a retail market, and uh, and I'm not convinced the retail market of VR is is here yet. Uh, and so I then, to answer your question of what do I think is next, I still go back into uh, uh, these, these iterative steps that we're finally getting, because, of the, because we've solved the problem of the speed problem, that we're now with the GPU, we're offloading the reality engine into a separate you know, set of threads on a separate processor, it frees us to now make, in my mind, better games that are deeper games. And you guys are already, I mean, you guys are also doing, you're already doing a masterful job of this. You guys are well ahead of the curve of creating games that don't just have the bells and whistles, but also have the intellectual property depth that I think is going to be demanded in this next era. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, thanks for being there, by the way. Um, you know, back then, uh, you know, designing a game was programming a game. Uh, simple question, are you still programming, or if not, when did you stop programming and uh, how did you find it? And it's not really to me, by the way. Yeah, so, uh, so what's interesting is, uh, um, so yeah, I used to program, and I drew the stick figure art, and I wrote all the text, even though I can't spell, much less speak properly. And, um, but in the early days, that was required. So, you know, there was only one person making a game. And so the first artist I ever hired, it was a, you know, great, because finally we had some better visuals. And, uh, and handing over programming was harder. The, for me, when I stopped being a programmer is when we switched from the Apple to the PC. And that was really just because uh, it was also switching from doing it solo to doing it as a team. And it just wasn't practical for me to go learn a new language and compete with the people I was hiring. It wasn't really uh, helpful. Uh, and that was, while that process was a bit painful at first because you're kind of losing control and you st I still felt like I was a competent programmer, uh, in the end, that's still great. I mean, in the end, you know, the programmers I hire now, every program, every artist and every programmer I've ever hired has been way better than I ever was. Uh, design is a more interesting issue, and uh, again, Jeff and I were talking about this yesterday. I got, I got in trouble once giving an interview to Polygon uh, uh, when I made the following kind of a statement. I said, look, you know, uh, every artist I've ever hired has been better than me. Every programmer, I, I might have been able to be a good programmer had, had I kept doing it, but in this day and age, you know, that skill is unnecessary and they're all better than me. 
But I said, designers is a different issue. You know, I've had this unique background in design where I had to do all those other parts. I was the programmer, I was the artist, I was the sound engineer, and that, that's really helpful for being a designer. And a lot of people who try to get into game design in our industry get in because they're not a programmer and they're not an artist. And so therefore, they still love games, they'll be a game designer. And I'm going, that is a, that's not a good reason to say that you are going to, you're going to have quality uh, skills at, at, at being a game designer. And there's no portfolio you can produce, like an, an artist can produce a video or you know, a flat file of their artwork. If you can look at a code, code samples from a programmer. It's harder to be trained as a designer. It's hard to prove your designer. And so the quote that I made in uh, at Polygon or wherever it was was, you know, uh, you know, I when I was interviewing a game designer, I've never during the interview process interviewed someone who I thought was better than me. And Polygon put that as the title of this article. Richard Garriott thinks he's the best game designer he's ever met. <laughs> and uh, and I was going, no, you, that's not the point. That wasn't that was not my point. There are plenty of game designers who are better than me. I just said that during the interview process, I, had, you know, I hadn't interviewed somebody who I, at that moment, thought was superior. And, but at least that also gives me why I think I still am, I'm employable, uh, because I've had this deep, unique background in, in game design. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. Uh, do you prefer the time when you work with smaller group, but have more time on your game, or now with bigger a bigger team but less time you know it's interesting because I, I think about that a lot I think about you know and I get asked that question even also you know do I pine for the past in some sense of the solo you know solo development effort and there were definitely some things about that that were had this purity to it that was great to say this is mine I did everything about that and that was there's something cool about it on the other hand it is completely impractical to consider tackling the complexity of the machines we're working on by yourself. And not that they, they aren't done. I, I, was, I was showing Jeff some um, games like this one called A Dark Room, a very simple pseudo text game. This is one of my favorite games on the on a mobile device uh, that is uh, you know, written by one or two guys you know, basically by themselves. And so those, they, those exist, but uh, you know, there are gonna be even fewer and farther between than AAA games that, you know, that you know, we're all in the business of trying to make. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, so it's hard. It's hard to say. I mean, you know, I, there's parts I enjoy about now, and there's parts I enjoyed about then. I would go back to that slide I said about some of my disappointments. That my main thing is, and I, you know, I've made the mistake twice now, so I'm sure I'll make it again. Uh, which is uh, the, uh, uh, you know, standing by your vision. Once you, if you really, if if your project director or whoever your creative lead on your your project is, if they have a clear vision in their mind as to what the game should be. You know, uh, the thing I've learned is, you know, you can talk to me about it and convince me to move, but unless I am fully believing in what you're trying to take me off of, you know, uh, moving the needle, you know, don't sacrifice your faith in your project for external uh, needs. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, Richard. So, uh, to this day, for me, or to the internet on a whole, uh, the live assassination of Lord British in Ultima Online... Reigns! Yes, remains the stuff of legend, and I've always been curious to know about it from your perspective as well. Yeah, so how that happened, so those of you who don't know, in the, in the Ultima Online beta, um, we, uh, the, the night the beta was coming to an end, and so we were going to turn off the servers, erase everyone's characters, and then the next morning, you know, 10 hours later, we're gonna turn it back on and everybody gets start from scratch. That was a big deal in the beta community. So, you know, we were all in there playing, and so everyone in the team was in the game playing, all the community was in there playing, but, uh, and Star and I, uh, you know, we didn't want everyone in the whole game to all pile into one map, right? So we, we sort of did this tour. We teleported from city to city to city to show up and say, you know, thank you and goodbye to everybody. And, uh, and it was fun to see what emergent behaviors occurred during this whole process. Like we went to this, one of the towns is called Moonglow, and when we showed up in Moonglow, all the people were standing to the north of us, and they all dropped their pants and bowed. <laughs> so that means they were mooning us in Moonglow. And so people were thinking about all these kind of funny things they could do all around as we were teleporting around, and so we were having a good time with it. And don't forget, this is still, you know, Skype doesn't exist at this point. You know, a lot of the modern tools we think of that are convenient for communication 
didn't yet exist. And that's important because, you know, I was in my office, Star was in Star's office, you know, we had a phone system in our office, but only like three or four of us could network together, so we didn't, we, frankly, we didn't bother, because we're also in the game, you can type to each other, right? So there's, we have no other forms of communication going between us and Q QA and, you know, everybody, and the community itself other than the game. And we get to the last town that we're going to give a talk in, and it's Trinsic. And we stand up on this parapet over the central courtyard of the town, and we're here giving our thank yous and goodbyes. When this gentleman who, at the time that it happened, we didn't even know who it was. We had to go back to our data logs to suss out who did this. And this guy named Rains, R-A-I-N-Z, I will remember him forever. Uh, <clears throat> he cast a fire field up in the parapet where me and Star were standing. And so your first reaction when fire engulfs you is you step out of it. So my first thing was to step back. Except, I've already told you how much fun people have killing Lord British. And so we work very hard in every game I do now to make sure my character is immortal. <laughs> and, 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 but oddly, we fail at it periodically, including this moment, which is, I thought, oh, I'm immortal, so I don't need to worry about the fire, and I can't see over the parapet now because I'm stepped back, right? And I can't see the people that I'm trying to talk with. So I step right back into the fire field and fall over dead. Because we had wiped our characters periodically already in the past, and each time I create my new character, I still had to go set a flag manually to make myself immortal. And I usually did it, and so people all assumed I was immortal, and I thought I assumed I was immortal, and so people had just not been testing me. So I'd been not immortal for a month, <laughs> but, but no one knew, including me. And, and so when I fall over dead, also it means I can't communicate. You turn into a ghost. And when you turn into a ghost in Ultima Online, if you try to talk, it just goes, ooh. <laughs> and so I'm going, ooh, you know. And, and the QA people are going like, oh my god, Lord Bridges is dead. You know, who did it? And how can we get him back? And so people are scrambling, trying to get my character back to life. And, and the QA people are going like, well, what do we do? You know, it's two minutes, three minutes, maybe before the servers go down. And someone in this crowd just killed Lord British. And there's, and there's no way we're going to figure out who it was before the servers go down. So let's murder them all. <laughs> and, and so literally, the QA people start unleashing dragons and demons and magic effects and all this kind of stuff. And we just start killing everyone pl present. And so we're actually having a great time. So now on the developer side, we're having a good time with this. But those other, what's interesting though is we were actually really pissing off other players. Because not only now were they dead and going ooh and not able to communicate, but for them to come back to life, they had to go off to a resurrection spot far away. And so instead of being able to be with us when the servers turned off, most of them were scattered far, far around. And so when the servers finally went down, they were pissed because they had kind of missed being there at this moment, even though we thought it was good fun. But anyway, that's the story of Reigns. Uh, who I've actually never met in person. And so, you know, one of these days I need to go, you know, but uh, <laughs> anybody here? Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, hi. Thank you for making Ultima 7. That kept me busy and not in problems during high school. So thank you for that. Um, you said that you went to reach for ideas far and wide, uh, and you're one of the lucky few that went to space. Uh, what have you seen or experienced there that you brought back to Earth and kind of brought in your games in some way or one other? Yeah, you know what's interesting about going to on these expedition travel that I do regularly uh, is how Damn I am you. <laughs> how I believe it informs game development, like and. One thing that it does not do is have me go try to recreate it. And so like if I was going to do like people go like, hey, you've been to space, you'd be perfect to go make a space launch simulator. And I'm going, well, yeah, except that a space launch, as amazing as the day of launch was, you know, you waking up six hours prior to launch, getting on your spacesuit, going through all these rituals, riding out, you know, climbing up to the fully fueled rocket, taking the eight and a half minute, you know, explosive ride into space, you know, six hours to dock. You know, that's a, that's a full 24 hours that is a pinnacle life experience. Yet, if you wrote a simulation for that, where you sit inside a rocket for four hours configuring it for launch, that would be really boring. And, and even the eight and a half minute ride from sitting on the Earth to being in space, eight and a half minutes is still eight and a half minutes. And so, you know, if you were simulating that on your PC, oh look, there's nothing out the window. 
oh, look, there's some gauges in a G-force meter, you know, that'd be really boring. And so uh, what I do is the following, like uh, uh, another story that for me was really inspirational was uh, going into Antarctica. And I was in Antarctica on the south side, the leeward side of a mountain range where wind had come across the top of this mountain range and scoured the ice on the downwind side of it. And the ice thickness in Antarctica is a mile thick. And so this ice was sculpted to where when we walked in this trench, it looked like a giant frozen tidal wave. And when you looked into this clear blue ice, you sort of felt like you expected to see a frozen dinosaur or woolly mammoth or something in the ice, which of course wasn't there. Uh, but the top of it was like dripping snow as it dripped off the top of this frozen uh, wave that looked like, like a, a Tim Burton movie. And so when I, when I stop and see that, I'm going like, wow, this is really impressive to see personally. But if I tried to draw this in polygons in a virtual world, it, it just wouldn't, it would, it wouldn't come across in that same way. But what I do is when I stand there, I look at that, I go like, wow, this, this feels awesome to me. It is literally awe-inspiring. What can I do? What can I, how can I create a reveal? I mean, since I, obviously standing at the bottom of a polygon thing where you don't have the sense of self and scale in the same way won't work. But what can I do that would do that? And so that's when I begin to think about, um, like, a, you all probably have this debate a lot about whether you should procedurally generate terrain areas or whether you should hand sculpt terrain areas. And that's a, a big cost benefit analysis that every game company goes through. My side of the fence, by the way, is hand sculpting. And the reason why is because it lets you create these moments of awe. That if you create a procedurally generated natural world, it will look very natural and very beautiful, but it will look generically very beautiful and natural. You'll miss, you know, Skull Island of Captain Hook to where the actual outline of the shape of the land mass or the rocks up on that ledge impart something more than reality. You want to do something that is, has a, this truthiness that it goes beyond natural beauty. And so those are the kind of my takeaways. My exploration takeaways are what do I do that can, uh, that can take people to these moments of awe uh, like I've had a chance to experience in space or Antarctica or wherever else it might be. Hmm? <coughs> Hello. Uh, so first off, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jeff, and everyone involved for making this happen. This is awesome. So um, I'm a teacher in college about uh, game design, um, and I I'll be curious with your vast experience, and I know a lot of those are watching right now, if there's any specific um, you know, tips, advice that you give to you know, aspiring game developers uh, in today's world. Yeah, and so I think the, you know, the, my, my core advice goes back to um, uh, the problem that I outlined between programmers, artists, and designers. Um, you know, for the programmers in the room, you know, you guys are also already acutely, and the artists for that matter, you're acutely aware that uh, the subspecialties of, the of those disciplines are now so deep that it's hard to be a generalist even. You, you know, if you're, if you're gonna do programming, are you doing AI? Do you do user interface? Do you uh, do the client server work, the patcher? You know, what subspecialty are you involved in uh, that makes it, frankly, difficult for them to even have the bird's eye view of what's going on across the whole project? And, uh, and the same thing for true for artists. Are you an animator? Do you rig? Do you paint? You know, what is it you do? And, uh, and we need now these subspecialties. And the problem for designers is that, you know, there's something, there's still, despite how much, how far we've come, if you go back to those diagrams of what I said was kind of 10 times faster, but a picture is 10 times bigger and memory is only 10 times bigger and a disk space is only 10 times larger. That means we are, there's always trade-offs. You know, not only is there a trade-off in the time and money that we have available to make a game, but the hardware has limits. You know, you're, somebody eventually has to sit down and go, well, the audio guy really wants to have, you know, full Dolby surround sound and a very high bit rate and context sensitive music that changes and ebbs and flows as the, you know, the tension changes in the game. And so they are happy to use all of the time, all of the money, all the memory, all the CPU speed for audio, if they could. And the same thing's true for AI and you know, you know, conversations and the, you know, how well-crafted your heads are on your avatars, uh, et cetera. And so that somebody still has to fundamentally be the designers, or at least the lead creative on the project. And so the closer you want to be to being that lead creative, 
the more important it is for you to have had all those bases of understanding. So you have to be a polyglot. You have to be someone, if, you know, it is just the fact that I didn't grow up being a great artist or a great programmer is not an excuse that that's okay as a, as a game designer. I think that you, if you are going to be a game designer, we are making computer games. You must fundamentally know how that computer operates. You must be able to at least script. And the, and the, the deeper you can understand that, the better. And, and so, for example, I, don't, I can't code now. If I had to sit down and write something in C, I couldn't do it. But I can, if, if I'm walking through it with one of my programmers, I can get it. I can follow along with it. I can read the comments, and I can see the flow, and I can sit there and debate with them as to how data is flowing around in the machine, because I still get that. And, uh, and so I think designers need to know that. And so, anyway, that's some thought. Thank you very much. That's the answer I was hoping for. <laughs> okay, anything else? Okay, good. <laughs> all right, I think we're done then, Jeff. So thank you all again. Appreciate it.